Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Cheetash. My name is Chris, and we will be going over Chapter 1 of The Bell Curve by Richard J. Herrnstein and Dr. Charles Murray. Before we start today, I just wanted to clarify one thing that we had discussed last time regarding this G, or general intelligence variable, that is, according to Charles Spearman and according to the authors, as we saw last time, at the core of intelligence. Uh, and the authors, as they stated last time, they are the classicists. They believe that intelligence, for the most part, most of it comes from this G factor, which was developed by Charles Spearman, which he developed from factor analysis. If you remember... I think it was Spearman that we had talked about had noticed that when he was administering tests, he noticed that people who did well in certain areas would do well in other areas. And then people who did poorly in this one area would do poorly in another area. This is where the correlation coefficient really helped helped uh, further this theory that Spearman had. So I just was looking online. We do not want to go there. And just a little bit on general intelligence G factor. This is from verywellmind.com. General intelligence can be compared to athleticism. A person might be a very skilled runner, but this does not necessarily mean that they will also be an excellent figure skater. So to me, that kind of makes sense. I'm from an athletic background. I kind of get where they are coming from in that somebody can be just a great athlete. Like they can be have great cardio. They're strong. I see this in jujitsu a lot, what I train in. If somebody's got great cardio and they are strong, big, flexible, they're going to come in already like a kind of a step ahead of other white belts who maybe have been even some white belts who have trained in jiu-jitsu but aren't as athletic, right? But you have those three factors and some other other factors that come in. You're already like ahead of the curve, so to speak. So I just wanted to know what are the components. This is a, kind of exactly what I wanted to kind of find out. What are the components of general intelligence? And according to this website, fluid reasoning, knowledge, uh, quantitative reasoning, visual spatial, working memory. So I, I was a little confused on this. I don't know if anybody else was either on what exactly is involved in G. But again, G kind of encompasses a lot of different things. So are you good with numbers? How's your like short-term memory? How's your visual spatial skills? Um, how's your, can you solve problems? Can you extrapolate? Like think about something in the future? Things of that note. So I just wanted to bring that up before we officially start on chapter one, which is titled Cognitive Class and Education, 1900 to 1990. Again, this book was written, or came out rather, in uh, 1994. So as you can tell, what's going to be the main focus of this of this chapter? It's going to be on education. The authors start the chapter in the 20th century. America opened the doors of its colleges wider than in any previous generation of Americans. As we are going to see. Most people in early, the early 1900s did not go to college. Most of the youth, it's not like today. Today, and they kind of explain this, most of your circle of friends probably did have, does have a college degree. At least, you know, for, for my circle of friends, yes. Back then, your circle of friends included, probably included people who did not have college degrees, mostly. They were tradesmen, farmers, other agricultural endeavors, 
maybe they just went into the family business. They worked in the factory, you know. Not as common back then. But then, all of a sudden, you saw a huge spike. Huge spike. And it's now, it's as you can see today, everybody's got a college degree, it seems like. You know, there's this phrase that gets thrown around that the college degree, a bachelor's degree, has become kind of like the high school, what a high school degree was, in a way. So although the what the authors are going to argue in this chapter, although the doors opened and more and more kids are going to college, the cognitive separation does not decrease. It actually increases even more, staggeringly more. So the the smartest of the smart are congregating at just a few universities. And yes, more kids are going to college, but more of the smartest of the smart are going to colleges where there are other smartest of the smart kids. And it's kind of forming a bubble. And think about how that is affected. Again, this came out in 1994. Do you think it's gotten better or worse since then? And and I'm not saying that it's a bad thing that that's happening, but it's gotten more, I think, a better way to phrase that would be it's gotten more pronounced. So what do they mean? The authors start off, talking about the Harvard freshman class, 1952. Again, 1952, after World War II, you have Harvard freshman class mostly coming from the East Coast. Okay, Harvard, it's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So you're going to have a lot in New York, uh, Philadelphia, Maybe D.C., Boston, definitely, Connecticut, Rhode Island. Most of the students came from that area, mostly Christian. Probably mostly men, white, and also from exclusive boarding schools like Phillips Exeter, uh, Phillips Andover. These kind of, I've heard of these names before. These are very famous like schools. I think... Um, George George W. Bush went to one of these schools out there in Massachusetts, Phillips Exeter, something like that. But this is where they're mostly coming from. And Harvard wasn't particularly that hard to get into in 1952. The authors state, you know, okay, if 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 your father graduated from Harvard, damn, you're pretty much damn near guaranteed in. Um, your chances, other than that, two out of three people got in. And the smartest, the Harvard didn't quite contain the smartest of the brightest kids like it is known for today. The authors talk about the mean SAT verbal score for this incoming freshman class in 1952 was 583. For some context, the authors say this is an above-average score. But it's nothing to really, like, brag about. You know, you would expect it to be higher, I guess, coming from, especially from a 2021 perspective looking at this. And I have, for just reference here, the average in 2020 in high school graduates was 528. And I'm just kind of curious, 583 compared to 528, how significant of a difference that is be interesting to take a look at that let's continue on so that was harvard in 1952 now flash forward eight years later harvard in 1960 something drastic happens and actually this is kind of foreshadowed by the dean at harvard I'm going to see if I can find this passage, because I believe this was page 30. Wilbur J. Bender, Harvard's Dean of Admissions, was about to leave his post and trying to sum up for the Board of Overseers what had happened in the eight years of his tenure. 
and he says the figures he wrote report the greatest change in Harvard admissions and thus in the Harvard student body in a short time, two college generations in our recorded history. And then the authors write, Suddenly, but for no obvious reason, Harvard had become a different kind of place. So what happened? Check this slide out. The proportion of students coming from the New England area, again, New York, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Philadelphia, that whole Northeast, dropped by a third. Two-thirds of the applicants are now being rejected. Way stricter policy on the applications, on, ad, on admissions. The mean SAT verbal score jumped to 678 from, what was it before? 583, right? 583. The mean SAT math score, 695. And just for some context, the average... SAT math score in 2020 among high school graduates was 523. So roughly, I mean, pretty much the same age. You're talking high school graduates and then Harvard incoming freshman class. So same age. 695 SAT math score. The 1960 math score would be in today's 90th percentile. That means that a kid who got a 695 on the SAT math score did, 90, did better than 90% of the students that took the SAT that year. So all in all, the average incoming freshman in 1952... Again, top, probably top of his high school, his or her high school. Coming to Harvard, you'd be average. In 1960, just eight years later, would be at the bottom of the class, according to those test scores, comparing SAT test scores from 1960 to 1952. Wow. That's just in eight years. So the the authors kind of take a look at this and ask the question, why is this important? Well, education affects income. And income is a means of div division. Not that it's used for that, but income divides. I'll say it the way I put it on the slide. And education affects occupation, and occupation divides. School is where high cognitive people excel, and low cognitive people fail. I have a typo in there. And low cognitive people fail. So what they're saying here is, there's a stratification of the high IQ and the lower IQ. This is going to be seen even further after graduation with, with the incomes that these two groups of people earn and with the jobs that they occupy. Right? One of the staggering things they say is, yeah, sure, early 1900s, the brightest of the bright oftentimes didn't go to college. So you could have somebody very smart who was a farmer. Somebody very smart who worked at the shop that his parents passed down to him. But now, more and more, these colleges were getting access. They were admitting these kids who before wouldn't have gone to, to their colleges, but now they're getting them into their colleges. And we're kind of going to find out wh what exactly happened in order to make this work. But there, the authors talk about three sorting processes at work here. So one, the college population grew. More and more people going to college. 
and they're being recruited, number two, they're being recruited by cognitive ability more efficiently. And three, once they're in college, there's even more sorting at work. We're, what we're going to see is the there's a difference between attending the college and even less people finish college and graduate. Let's continue forward. So the college population starts to grow. This is all starting on page 31. Social and economic gap at the start of the 20th century not accompanied by much of a cognitive gap. Like I was saying, vast majority of bright people did not go to college. And they can kind of say this with confidence, even with the lack of IQ scores from 1900. Again, the military was the first kind of body in the United States that really started administering IQ tests. They weren't really utilized in other aspects of American life or in like civilian life. But for World War I, I think we saw that from the introduction, they were, they were, they were used. They were used on incoming recruits. They were given an IQ test. So even with the, this lack of IQ scores, it's safe to say that this, this was true. Vast majority of bright people did not go to college. In, in, in the authors, we're going to see a graph on the next page, next slide. In 1900, only 2% of 23-year-olds received college degrees. This slide. And you can see the title of the graph here. In the 20th century, the prevalence of college degrees goes from 1 in 50 to a third of the population. So you see down here, look at that, 1920, new bachelor's degrees as percentage of 23-year-olds. 20, pretty low, less than 5%. 1920, the Roaring Twenties, Great Depression. Now you're starting to get into World War II. Dipping during uh, those years, mid to late 1940s. And then right as we're approaching 1950, huge spike. And the authors note this. There was a huge spike in the college population. Now, they posit that this might have been because we had two generations of classes on campuses at one time. You got to think, not only did you have men and women who were not in war go to college, but then the people that came back and the GI Bill and people going, coming back from the war, going to college. So they were all there at the same time. But this tilt, this is interesting because if you see here, this huge spike in the mid to late 1940s, there was also another huge spike in the mid to late uh, 1960s. And then there's this been this large uptick from like the early 1980s to 1990. And there's also dips. There's a huge dip from 1974 to 81. And there's another, as you can see, that, that's the most, that's one of the prominent ones um, that the authors say occurred when the generosity of scholarships and loans from institutions would at, was at its peak. I mean, there were some other ones, the, sh the sharp decline late 1960 to like 1970, 71. So look at, just look at the spikes and look the percentages of bachelor's, new bachelor's degrees as a percentage of 23 year olds steadily overall has, has increased since 1920. So is it just the fact that it opened up to more people? Like a broader range of people going to college? Well, okay, maybe. Maybe, you know, you got to think 
more colleges have opened up since then. You have, I mean, let's think about it in 2020 terms here. You probably have more online schools, online programs. There's for-profit um, these like universities, like I think University of Phoenix is one. So community colleges too popping up, probably more so than in the um, 1920s. So more people are, overall, more people are going to college. And okay, maybe that might be true, but the authors are want to make sure that you get this point that at the same time many more are going to college, they were also being selected over way more efficiently, and they were being selected by cognitive ability. So we are going to the next graph here. Efficiency in getting the smartest kids in college. So let's take a look at this graph. At mid-century, America abruptly becomes more efficient in getting the top students to college. And as, I, as you can see there, what is this graph telling? From 1925 to 1950, the percentage high school graduates in the top IQ quartile who went directly to college. About 55% of them, and relatively stable from 1925 to 1950. And then boom, right at 1950, right after the war, look at this huge trend in just 10 years, 15 years, so like mid-1960s, huge uptick. So midnight by the mid-1960s, what is that? About 80% of the people in the top IQ quartile went directly to college. They're not going into farming. They're not going into the family. I mean, maybe some of them still are, but the the family business, blue-collar jobs, tradesmen, they're going directly to college. One in seven of the top youth going to college in 1925. Two out of seven in 1950, four out of, the, four out of seven in 1960. Smartest kids are starting to go to college more. More of the smartest kids are going to college. That might be a better way of saying it. And where are they going? Here's where the stratification is going to come in because they're not just going to community college or the local state college. And maybe that's what it was early on. But they're going to those elite schools, or at least they're trying to get into those elite schools. Next graph here, what do we have? Further, this is just kind of furthering the point that we were making on the last slide, just on the fact that the smartest of the smart kids are going to college at increasing rates. Between 1920s, 1960s, college attendance becomes much more closely pegged to IQ. So this graph uh, might be a little confusing, but there's three lines here. We've got one line for the mid-1920s, one line for the early 1960s, and one line for the early 1980s. IQ percentiles on the x-axis. So as the IQ percentile increases, again, percentile means you are doing better than that percentage of the survey or study population. So 80th percentile for IQ. Your IQ is better higher than 80% of the subjects in the study or sample, survey, whatever. So in the mid-1920s, you see here, even as the IQ percentile increases, the line kind of stays, I mean, it increases a little bit. But if your IQ percentile was at the 80th, 80th percentile, The chances of you going to college were the same as if you had an IQ percentile of 30%, right? It was relatively, like, stable, steady. So what this graph is saying is the IQ increases, the chances of going to college increase 
in early 1960s, early 1980s. The top IQ kids in the 1920s, they were going to college, but not at a greater percentage compared to the lower IQs. Look at this for the 1980s. Look at this. Top 80th, 90th percentile of IQ, about, what would that be? About 70 to 90% of those high school graduates go to college. I mean, 1920s, look at that. It's about 40, 30, 40%. And the cognitive soaring, this is something that I had touched on just a little bit earlier. It doesn't stop there because it's one thing to get into college, but one thing to finish college. So look at this graph. Cognitive sorting continues from the time that students enter college to the time they get a degree. So you can see one line is the students entering college. The other line is students completing the BA, bachelor's. So as we see, there's a huge gap. Percentage of the college students with a IQ percentage of, let's say, 50. 30% of them entering college, only 10% graduate. And there is this divide even for the other IQ percentiles, even if you're really smart, let's say 80th percentile. You've got 60% percentage of the college students in the 80th percentile, but only 30% finish. And that's about half. So you're being sorted not just on your IQ entering, but on your IQ when you finish. And that's going to sort. That's going to sort out the population even more. You finish college, you get the bachelor's. It's going to open up opportunities for you, as far as occupations. And like the author said, occupations divide. So here we have a comparison between the Ivy League schools and the state of Pennsylvania, 1920s versus the 1960s. And again, we want to iterate the elite schools in the early, early 20th century had bright kids, but also they had a lot, of, a lot of kids around the average, around the mean. And as you, we progressed throughout the century, the student body started to shift. Mean IQ of entrance into Ivy League and Severn Sisters schools in 1926 was 117. Average student at one of these schools was in the 88th percentile of IQ. So then the authors talk about, okay, they studied the high school seniors just in Pennsylvania at about the same time, 1928. And the IQ for these students, for all of the Pennsylvania colleges, incoming freshmen, I think is what they're referring to, was 107 Average student at one of these schools was in the 68th percentile. And 10 Pennsylvania colleges had freshman classes with mean IQs at the 75th to 90th percentile. So smart kids were going to not just the elite schools. They were going to the local, local state schools. The school right down the road. Now, flash forward to the 1960s. Exercises repeated for 1964. Pennsylvania colleges, 1964, had an average freshman IQ at about the 89th percentile. Ivy and 70, <laughs> Ivy League and the Seven Sisters, incoming freshmen, average incoming freshman IQ, 99th percentile. So the Pennsylvania colleges kind of stayed the same. Ivy League, Seven Sisters, which are 
Seven Sisters are, I think, exclusively uh, uh, schools for women. They only got stronger, 99th percentile, the best of the best. And there's a gap starting to show up. That's kind of what this graph is showing, cognitive stratification in colleges by 1961. This is showing, the you see at the top here, SAT verbal score and the x-axis. Towards the left, you have the lower scores, mean of high school seniors who did not go to college. Score right around 300 in 1961. Then you have mean of high school seniors who went to, and they have a successive list of colleges, universities, Georgia Southern, NC State, Villanova, Tulane, Colby. And as the score creeps up and up and up, you have less and less and less and less students going there. So here's a question. What changed... What changed to have the elite students start going to the elite schools? What changed? One of the things was, oh, and let's talk about this, factors considered. I won't get ahead of myself, but factors considered. Harvard in 1960 had fewer kids from low-income families compared to 1952. So what the authors are saying here, this was not due to college becoming, you know, more families like affording it. No, there was less kids from low-income families in 1960 compared to 52. Harvard became 40% more expensive. This is according to $1990 dollars. And also, Harvard in 1960 decided not to admit students purely on the basis of academic potential. So you would think that this would kind of open up the doors for other people who brought other things to the table, not just high IQ, but maybe they were great athletes or, I don't know, great uh, student organizers, great uh, speakers. They volunteers, you know, honor society, like volunteering efforts. Maybe they decided to to do that or, or to, to admit purely based on IQ, but they didn't. They brought in more broader ranges. They, they considered more broader ranges of human quality. And the dean actually voiced at the time was was in opposition to this and the effect that it would it would have on the student body having just high IQ high IQ people surrounded in a bubble all around each other would being part of a high prestige institution be good for the development of college aged kids it's very interesting also the baby boom generation like the biggest generation at the time i don't even think Millennials eclipsed it? I don't I don't think so. Um, they weren't quite fully on campus yet. So you can't say that th these trends are due to the influx of the baby boomers. Weren't quite old enough yet. So two trends to consider. This is uh, page starting on page 41. Television started to come of age. 1950s the shift from radio to tv so marketing the, the i bet you i mean these universities were better able to get their get their message get their institution out there as like a form of advertising like hey come to our school hey come to penn state <laughs> joe paterno commercial from years ago um and maybe not in a way that they were like advertising like you see today, but who knows? You got to see people, scientists being interviewed from Harvard, you know, other business professionals from Harvard, et cetera, et cetera. 
and that's just kind of like my opinion on that. But television did come of age. <laughs> this is what the authors talk about in the book. Um, also, long distance travel be, starts to become commonplace. So in the 1920s, you got a farm girl in Kansas, super smart, did well in school. Well, it's kind of hard to get to Harvard out in the Northeast. Right? 1950s come along, all of a sudden travel isn't as, it, it's a little more convenient. And I have a link in here, like uh, America's heyday. Um, air travel becomes a lot more popular. I think they shifted from propeller airplanes to like the the like engines, uh, you know, without the use of the, or the need for propellers. And this is something else that the authors talk about in early stages of an increased demand that resulted from expanding number of affluent customers competing for scarce goods. And I don't, here's, I don't quite get it. This is pretty much taken word for word from the book. I don't quite really get what they're trying to say by this statement, but I do with the next statement. You, new universities were built, as I was stating earlier, community colleges probably popped up. There was probably an increase in those, the for-profit colleges, online learning, et cetera, et cetera. But there's not new Harvards. There's not new Stanfords. Those schools are one, one of a kind. Princeton's, you know, Brown, Cornell, Penn. Sure, lots of schools are opening up, giving access to many students, giving access to, to high school seniors to be able to go get a college degree, but there's not new Harvards being built. So there's an increased competition to get into those schools. And think about this, because I, I did a little bit of some research on school closings, especially now 2021. Um, you probably might see more and more of this. The lower level, lower tier schools, community colleges, for-profit universities, etc. Without the students in the classroom, who knows if they'll survive? And think about there's been a decreasing birth rate in America too. So now schools are going to have to compete to bring in students. There's going to be a decrease in, in the pool for potential students. So I suspect that more and more schools are going to have to change their models a little bit or shut down. There's, they're not going to be able to get enough students. Think about what that... Think about if you're at a school and all of a sudden it shuts down. How would that work? Like, would you even get your degree? I, I don't know. I, uh, I would have to look that up. I don't know what would happen if, if, if that happened. If you can just transfer to another school and your credits would transfer. I don't know. So, page forty-two changes since the nineteen sixties. Competition, this is kind of what we were talking about, competition for entry into the other elite schools has stiffened comparably. And there was some data that was cited here by the authors from Robert Frank, Philip Cook. There was a science talent search, Westinghouse science talent search finalists in 1960s. 47% went to the top seven colleges. 1980s, this had risen to 59%. 39% of those were going to just three schools, Harvard, MIT, Princeton. I forgot about MIT. That's another great school. Check this out, too. Uh, top 25 large and small universities together had 59,000 of the 1.2 million students who entered colleges in the fall of 1990. Small chunk of that 1.2 million. 
12 out of the 20 of the nation's freshmen who scores in the 700 who scored in the 700s in the SAT verbal went to the top 25. 7 out of the 20 of the students who scored in the 600s went to the top 25. 19 out of the 20 of the students who scored in the 600s or above in the SAT verbal. 19 out of those 20 are going to the top 25 universities. Very, very concentrated. Let's go to page 24 here. This is, we're gonna see a graph, um, a bell curve actually, uh, of a normal distribution. So this is, and there's a section in the back of the book starts around page 550, appendix one, that kind of goes into like a little bit of statistics and like definitions, what things are, just so you can have a general knowledge of it. What is a normal distribution? It's a bell-shaped curve with most people getting scores in the middle range, and then there's a few at the tail ends of it. So most people are gonna be in the middle, and then the special cases, are gonna be at the tail ends. And then from there you have standard deviations or the spread about the mean. So, you know, the authors make a point in the book, like a horse, let's say you have a normal distribution of animal heights. A horse is six feet tall. A snake is 12 inches long. Right, that that doesn't, I mean, it tells you something, right? You can compare those two, six feet, way bigger than 12. But around the mean, right, the, the, the horse is, now if I, let's, let me put it this way. If I was to tell you the horse is three standard deviations away from the mean, the snake is a half. That tells you a lot. That means amongst, the animal surveyed, that horse is pretty dang tall. And the authors get into the percentiles of standard, de of if you are at a certain standard deviation, you're like at a certain percentile of that distribution, of that like surveyed population. So three standard deviations, you're talking about damn near, I mean, 80, 90th percentile. It means that horse is pretty damn tall. Meanwhile, like a half standard deviation not very much. I mean, you're already pretty damn close to the mean. So, any anyway, just a little statistics for you. There it is. There's that bell curve. In 1930, cognitive stratification was only a minor part of the social landscape. And as I write here, at any given level of cognitive ability, the number of people without college degrees dwarf the number who had them. So look at this. Look at everyone without a college degree. Look at that distribution there. That's the big that's the big bell curve. Then there's the small one, all college graduates. So look at the mean of the college graduates. Not that far off from the mean from everybody without a college degree. Now check this out. nineteen ninety the area under the darkened bell curve grows that means that the the population grows and look at that look at the mean change for all college graduates getting closer to one standard deviation away from the mean and look at Everyone without a college degree has kind of stayed the same. I want to point something out too. Look at where Harvard, the, the Ivy League, the Seven Sisters are in the first graph. They're about like one, almost one and a half standard deviations above the mean for IQ. Look at where they are in 1990. They're almost at three standard deviations away. And as I write here, is this partition concerning? Is it concerning? Is it like the Harvard dean 
was saying this was where, which slide was this is this kind of dangerous to have would being part of a high prestige institution be good for the development of college aged kids when you're surrounded by now i, I kind of think about this two ways when you're surrounded by other high level let's let's look at this from a sports percent perspective you're the top guy at your high school in football then you go to alabama hey alabama's got 20 30 40 other five stars there okay, maybe not that much but you know what i mean you're not special there you're one of 20 you know so do you think that that would make you better? I think probably, yeah. You're going to be forced to step your game up to compete with those other guys. Whereas in high school, maybe you didn't really have to work that, you know, you were already pretty, you were already like a lot better than these guys. No, 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 not at Alabama. It's going to force you to work harder. Now let's, in regards to IQ, Okay, so the, the, this competition amongst other high, high IQ people is going to force you to perform better. But it's going to further divide you from, let's be honest here, the rest of society. Again, look at, look at on this slide right here where those, the top dozen universities are. Almost three standard deviations. Are you even going to interact anymore with the population that's closer, most of the population, which is closer down here, one, zero standard deviations from the mean? Is that going to be healthy for society? Think about the occupations that the top universities have potential to work in and the ones down here. Think about the positions of power that get opened up to the people up here at three standard deviations. The people, one, zero, not really having those same opportunities. And maybe, I mean, I don't know the exact IQ scores of people in Congress, but some pretty powerful people, powerful families, probably still pretty smart, at least I'll say this, high IQ, <laughs> high IQ. Let's go to page 47 and the differences between 1930 and 1990. This is kind of stuff we've already talked about. Only a small portion of the 1930 population was in a position to have the kind of circle of friends that characterize the readers of this book. This is where I was referred to this earlier. A group of friends in 1930 scattered various IQs. Today, chances of that, lower. And the sword cuts both ways. Friendship circles at the bottom of the educational scale comprise lower and narrow ranges of IQ today than they did in 1930. So, yes, the smartest of the smart, those friendship circles are are getting more and more concentrated with the smartest of the smart. But also, the other friendship circles with the lowest of the low, they are getting more of the lowest of the low. And you see society dividing among these lines. This is kind of where these the authors are going here. And as I said, the smart kids in 1930s who went on to blue-collar work are now going to universities. And there's rarely any overlap. Look at this. High school graduates with college degree, with college graduates, the median overlap in, in IQ, 7%. High school graduates with PhDs, MDs, LLBs, the IQ median overlap. So this is kind of saying how much these two groups of people are overlapping with each other when it comes to IQ. And there's not much. The PhDs, MDs, LLBs, way higher IQs than the high school graduates. 
And still, there's not even that much overlap between these higher degrees, PhDs, MDs, LLBs, than college graduates. I mean, 21%, but still, that's these guys are like leaps and bounds ahead. Think about the concentration of IQ at some of these colleges and the effect that it has on the student body. They tend to develop their own unique set of conventional wisdoms. And they take those wisdoms with them throughout the rest of their life. So what happens now in society when there's these two divisions, two different sets of conventional wisdoms? And you have these higher IQ people taking part in positions of power, higher IQ occupations, etc. And the rest of society is down at the other end of the spectrum having to kind of listen and go to these people for services, etc. I think this is pointed, the, the best way to say this is right here, page 50, my, my last point before we leave. When people live in encapsulated worlds, it becomes difficult for them to grasp realities of worlds with which they have little experience. Creates division. And with that, we are done with chapter one. Very powerful stuff, guys. Um, I am going to continue on in two weeks. We're gonna we're gonna go over chapter two, which is let me give you guys a little preview on what chapter two is: cognitive partitioning by occupation. There we go. So we will do that in two weeks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I did. This is very interesting stuff. Can't wait to do it again in two weeks. Guys, thank you very much if you listened this far. I really appreciate it. Give me a follow on the Float app. Just joined there not too uh, a couple weeks ago. We'll be on YouTube, Rumble, Brighteon, BitChute. Thank you guys so much for listening. My name is Chris. Until next time, take care, guys.